you you mean mean some some Because this is what I asked last week and I've got a mouthful. I'll go when I want to go. You go five minutes before the class starts. You're going to make any difference. Not everybody can go on demand. Oh, yes, they can. <laughs> want to see? <laughs> Right, just here. Oh, oh, it's too nice. They all look for the day. Oh, oh, it's too nice. They all look for the day. Oh, it's too you're talking to the All right, now. I'm going to edit the uh, vacuum. <laughs> no, it's, it's unfair now. I'm going to edit it. Sorry. Quiet him down. Barry. David. Yudim. Yudim. Haverim. So, the recipe for Kugel is... <laughs> Good morning. So, let me just uh, remind you where we, where we are. This is the last, the fourth uh, lecture in an ongoing attempt to create a history of Jewish and Israeli art that is not a... That is not from the perspective of history of art, this is not a class in history of art, but from a rather philosophical point of view, that has issues in the religious and, and the theological and philosophical terms. But it's mostly about the body, it, mostly, it has mostly been a corporal history of Jewish and uh, Israeli art. And we did. Uh, And we had a discussion about uh, medieval and late 19th century and early Zionism, and we did some Israeli art that did the Six Days War, and we looked at some contemporary Israeli art. But some of you may sit there in, the, in your seats and be wondering, have we not forgotten something rather big? Isn't there an issue that is central, that is crucial to Jewish life that we have completely overlooked? So today we're going to deal a little bit with the Holocaust. Of course, of course, we are not equipped to make a thorough and deep philosophical discussion of the Holocaust in one hour, in one hour and the way it uh, relates to Israeli art and to Jewish art. This, this is, of course, way beyond the scope of this lecture. I do want to point that there are on YouTube several lectures I gave on art in the Holocaust, but they are in Hebrew. So, if you are interested, I'm going to point to some things here in this lecture that I'm going to just touch but not go deep into, but they are on YouTube in Hebrew. Our program for today is pretty much like this. I'm going to start with a little, very, min very minor discussion about the art that was actually done in the Holocaust, at the camps. Because this may come as a surprise to you, but people created art wherever it was humanly possible. In the most, in the harshest of terms, when it was either food or art, when it was the, the, somebody found some iodine to put on the wounds, somebody used it instead of healing his wounds to paint the gout. And when somebody's nails grew a, a little uh, thick, they scratched a figure on the side of the bed with their nails. People made art until, I mean, this image is from 1945 Buchenwald. So, as long as it was humanly possible, Jews made art in the camps. As long it, as it was possible, when, it, when people were starving, why is this important, actually? You may say to, you may ask yourself, why is this important? I remember a few years ago, when I was uh, at uh, Dachau in uh, Germany. In 2006, I had a... 
like the airplane is going to land here. Yeah. <laughs> Close. And in 2006, I, ha I had an exhibition in Germany of my works, and the people, the gallery that hosted me, <coughs> so they took me to a tour of, the, of Munich and the surrounding places, and they took me to Dachau, so it feels like a tourist attraction. And in Dachau, there's a small museum of the inmates' art. And I was looking at the art that was made in Dachau until the very last moment, and I was asking myself, what, what was going on in the mind of these people that knew that if somebody caught them painting, drawing, writing a poem, they will be immediately executed for that? What was going in their minds? And my thought is like this. You don't have to accept it, of course, but you do. <laughs> my thought is like this. The entire German propaganda machine is the claim that Jews are not people, that they are not human, that they are insects and vermin and mice and mice and rats, and they should be exterminated. And if you create out what you are saying to the German people, that you are not exterminating us, you are murdering people. There's a big difference between extermination and murdering. There's a big difference between dying like a mouse and dying like a person. And art, for these people, in my mind, was a crucial thing that makes the point that they are human because it's the Tselem Elohim Sheba Adam, the form of God in, in, in men. Why is creating art the form of God in men? Like you remember in Genesis, God says he creates the man in his own form. Why is creating art the form of God in man? I think because God is creating and we are creating. And if you are not creating, I mean, if you, if you are only consuming, like a rat or a mouse, and not creating, then maybe they are right. So the battle is not about survival. This, is, this, is, this battle has been lost. You are not going to survive. This is not whether you're going to live or die. But it is about whether you're going to die as a human being that has been murdered or as a vermin that has been exterminated. And this is a crucial point for me. No questions. Sorry, I turned. Okay, is that Okay. So, the first part of, the, of our talk, I will say something I already have, but I will say something about art that was made in the camps. Then we're going to see some works of Jewish and Israeli art that has something to do with the Holocaust. And we will uh, deal with some of the issues that came up through the, through the previous lectures. And the MC Center, the, uh, the, these issues. And then we're going to try to address them. But this is only done in order to set the stage for the great finale. Because I want to dedicate the last part of this lecture to what is the most important thing for me, and this is to pay close attention as close as possible to the art of Moshe Gershuni, whom I said earlier in, a late, in an earlier lecture, I think is the greatest Israeli artist, and I'm going to claim here, I'm going to stand here and claim, was the only Israeli artist, maybe the only Israeli person, that had the powers, spiritual, religious, mental, aesthetic powers to carry the load of dealing with the tragedy of this scope. So, and, and making a significant, uh, a significant contribution to the way that we are experiencing our own grief. So, this is, the, this is how we're going to do. Our opening start, our opening start, our, our, our opening point is going to be a rather philosophical one about what is the nature of art. And I've uh, alluded to this in the opening statement about art being the form of God in man. And I'm going to say a few things about what art is. And maybe before we get to this, let's say a few more words about what was the Holocaust. Of course, this is, this is, uh, this, is obvious, this needs it doesn't need to be said, it's so obvious, but even the most obvious things need once in a while to be said. People need to say it. So the Holocaust was 
In the words of the French philosopher Jean-François Lyotard, an earthquake that ruined the tools of its measurement. I mean, the tools in which you measure sociological, philosophical, political, social events, like sociology, anthropology, political studies, the economy, uh, the rulers have been broken. You cannot measure this in the, the old tools. Lyotard says, what is anthropology? What is anthropology in, in, when you try to understand the Holocaust with it? What is sociology? What is political studies? What is economy? What, is, what, is, what are these sciences of human, human sciences? What are they? Uh, uh, I mean, one needs to understand that the Germans attacked the Jews that were not their enemies. The Jews did not make terror attacks. They were not terrorists. The Jews did not steal their jobs because they were Germans. There is no such thing as a German stealing a German job. It's, it's ridiculous. And the Jews did not kidnap their daughters. On the contrary, people wanted their kid, kids to marry a Jew because they were great husbands. And the Jews and, and great wives. And Jews were not the enemies and they were not... Uh, the German, the anti-Semitic uh, propaganda went both ways. Jews were both the communists, but Jews were not communists, they were business owners. But the propaganda also said they were the international capitalists that undermines the unity of the bodies, uh, the body of the, the German bodies, of the Volksgemeinschaft, the, the community of people. Okay. So Jews were both the capitalists and the communists, but they were none of it. They were good patriotic citizens, and they were heroes of the First World War, and they were not the enemies. The Germans attacked the Jews under a new category that was completely and utterly imagined. Race is completely an imaginary fiction category. One must realize this. You, you only need to take a look on the street to see Jews, that one is from Africa, the other is black, the, the other is blonde, that there is no such thing as a Jewish race. It's just, it's a completely imaginary category. And for a completely imaginary category to rise up so suddenly and to make people fight against their brothers, the, the civil brothers, the people they, they fought together in World War I, under a completely imaginary new category. That was a catastrophe that is philosophically unparalleled. Also one needs to understand that the Holocaust is not... It's not only that the Germans turned against the Jews that were not their enemies. They turned against the Jews when turning against the Jews was killing them in the war effort. One must realize that the trains that took the Jews of Saloniki, the Jews of Oslo, to Auschwitz were really needed for coats and weapons in the Eastern Front. German soldiers died freezing in Russia because somebody preferred to use the trains to ship 25 Jews of Saloniki instead of just shooting them like this, they did again, go home. No, they had to be sh trained, shipped in trains to Auschwitz. Why is this? The 80 Jews of Oslo. I mean, this is preposterous. So the monstrosity of this event, the, pro the, the, the ridiculousness of it, the, the irrationality of it, the, of it, is of such a scope that is unparalleled in human history. This, this had to be said. So, our, our key work for this discussion will be the portraits by Anna Gottliebova in Auschwitz. Now this is an amazing story, I bet some of you have already heard it, but for those of you who haven't, Anna Gottliebova, uh, uh, Dina Gottliebova, uh, was a Jewish prisoner in uh, Auschwitz and she was taken to the uh, use of uh, Mengele who was a sadistic, uh, the world doc, the word doctor does not fit here. He was some kind of, experiment. he was making experiments on the prisoners, etc. And he took Dina Gottliebova to, under his wing and her job was to make portraits of the different nation of people because he was such a gifted portraitist. And 
to and she was needed he needed her in order to prove the point that the gypsy's eyes are too close that the skull of Jews is too round that the, now this is all fictitious of course there's no scientific fact in any of it but she survived the Holocaust by serving him as a portraitist but one is struck immediately when he's looking at these pictures this is Auschwitz 1944 this is 1944 Auschwitz do you understand it is unfathomable this is un you cannot this is beyond anything that one can understand. This is beyond human understanding. This is Auschwitz, 1944. She sits in Dr. Mengele's office, and she's making portraits of gypsies. And one is immediately struck by the humane look that she, she possesses. By the way, that though she is there for just one purpose, to serve him, she serves us. She serves humanity. Because this gypsy woman does not look like a stereotypical, the eyes are too close, the skull is too... No, it looks like a brave, defiant, bright-eyed woman that you adore. And you look at her and you say, this, 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 this woman, she's a heroine. She's, she's, a, she's a one, like you look at her bravery, she stands there knowing she's about to die. This is amazing. And the kid, look at it, look how deep you can see the soul reflecting his gaze. So what she does, I think, is the most subversive thing a person can do. She walks in the eye of the storm, in the heart of darkness. She walks in the office of Dr. Mengele, and she creates a manifest against everything he believes in, right under his nose, right under his gaze. Two anecdotes, two small anecdotes about uh, Dina Gottlieb of us, the rest of her life. She survived Auschwitz, and she was even uh, she was, she worked for Walt Disney, and uh, and she made a rather uh, impressive career as an uh, animator. And late in her life, she sued the Auschwitz Museum for her own pictures that are still hang hanged there, wow. and lost. The pictures are still in Auschwitz as German property, and she lost it. So this is amazing. This is like something but the world that we live in. What I want to say is that these pictures, these portraits of, Anna, of Dina Gottliebova, have something to tell us about the art of painting. As opposed to pictures, as opposed to photography, as opposed to any other medium, the medium of painting has an innate, intrinsic quality of humanism. That is because of the fact that when you paint somebody, you see his face for a duration of time. You don't just press the button. You see his face for a duration of time, and you live with his face, and you understand him as a, as a wholeness, as a complexity. I mean, do you know, Martin Buber says uh, uh, in, uh, in his famous book, in I and Thou, Martin Buber says, that when you hate somebody, you hate parts of him. You hate that he has bad breath and he's always late for lectures and you hate that he is stingy, whatever. But when you love somebody, you love his entirety. You love him as a whole. You love the whole of him. You don't love part of him. You're not fetishizing him. You love the whole of him. And I think portrait painting is knowing the other as a whole. He's seeing him in his sorrow, in his grief, in his loss, in his time. When she paints him, him or her, she sees them as a world, a person who's a world, who's, who's, who's a history, she has a childhood and, pit and mother and memories and future. She has no future, she will be. But maybe a nice example for this is this portrait. Uh, uh, of Juan de Pareja by uh, Velázquez from 1648. It's hung in, uh, in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. I remember in the time I, w I lived in New York, I used to go a lot because it was free back then and uh, it was very cold outside. <laughs> and, 
It's no longer free though, right? Mm -hmm. They no, change it's, it. It's, you can give uh, to uh, yeah, $15. Yeah, you can give them a few dollars. You sell your page, they get it to your post your page. <laughs> But you can, so, it's a narrow It doesn't cost a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they didn't change it because I read it? Yeah, they, have changed. they have changed. They have changed. They have changed. They have changed. So, so, pay what you wish. Not yes. anymore. Not anymore. I think, Not anymore. No, I think yeah. now you have this. Yeah, $20. No, if you're no. Not true. If you're a resident of New York City, you don't have to pay money. Okay, so I used to, used to go for free and stand for hours in front of this painting of Juan de Pareja. The story of, the, of this painting is very famous. De Pareja was Velázquez's servant. He was the Moor servant, the black servant of uh, the court painter. And Velázquez was in Rome. He was uh, traveling in Rome in behalf of, uh, of uh, the Spanish king. And he was, uh, there, a rumor came to him that there is a contest of painters. In the Pantheon in Rome, all the Caravagistic painters, all the Chirif and Hontos from, uh, from, uh, from Amsterdam and Leiden, and the French uh, Caravagists from French, and uh, all, the, all the 17th century great masters were in Rome at the time, and they were making a painting contest, like a swimming contest, a painting contest. And he said uh, he had nothing on him, he had no equipment for a large canvas. He said to his uh, to his servant, sit down, I will paint you. And of course he won. Of course he won. Because he's Velasquez. You know that when Manet in 1864 saw Velasquez painting in the Prado, he wrote to Paris to his friends, uh, my dear friends, you can stop doing whatever it is that you're doing. Velasquez has, uh, painting has been done, Velasquez did it. Wow. This is uh, Manet's line. So, okay, so he's making this incredibly beautiful portrait of his man servant, of his uh, black servant, the Moor servant. But what we see here is weird. This man is a servant, but he looks proud. He looks, you can see his, you can see the conflict within. He's, he's a servant, but he is a proud man. You can see the complexity, the wholeness, what I'm talking about, the person is a whole. And something weird happened to Velasquez too. When they came back to, Ma to Madrid, he freed him. He could no longer have him as his servant. Because you can only have a man as a slave when you do not understand that he's a human being in his wholeness, that he has a soul and a childhood and dreams. Once you understand that the man is a whole, you cannot think of him as your possession. So when they came back to, Ma to Madrid, he, he freed him. And the Pareja went, uh, to have a nice career as a painter. So, so you, see, you see painting, I think the philosopher that was uh, most, uh, that made the most acute observation on this topic is Levinas, another Jewish philosopher, Emmanuel Levinas, that said that the face of the other is a moral imperative. The face of the other is a moral imperative. When you see the face of the other, you have a moral obligation to him. We all know this. You drive in the street, you drive in the road, and somebody wants to cut you. You say, fuck you, I will never let you cut. And, you go, and then he opens the window and he says, excuse me, can I? And he says, sure, man. And what happened? What just happened? Why, once the, why when the window is closed, you hate him and you want to kill him? And once you see his face, you say, sure. What happened? What happened is that the face of the other is a moral imperative. That once you see the other as a person, this is why the entire story about uh, Elora Zarya shooting the Anam, the terrorist going like this, Gush. if Elora Zarya would go like this, put his gun aside and make a portrait of the, uh, of the person for 25 hours, then he wouldn't be able to shoot him. You cannot shoot a person after you painted his face. You cannot, because then you see him as a whole. So, we open our lecture with this. But we, but we immediately move to the second part. As I said, there are about three or four uh, very elaborate lectures that I gave on Holocaust and art. They are on YouTube, but in Hebrew. So this is Michael Skan Cohen, and this is his, I think, most famous work, Hineni. For those of you who heard uh, Leonard Cohen last album, with the Hineni, Hineni, 
Well, what is Hineni? Well, it's an untranslatable word. You cannot translate it to any language. It's about, it's, it's five things. It's, here I am my Lord. This is what I am. This, when you say Hineni, you don't say Hineni over the phone to your mother. Yonatan Hineni Ima. You don't say this. You only say Hineni when God calls. Who is this? This is God, Hineni. This is, you understand? Hineni is a reply to God. And it says, I am here, my God. Hineni is, so who says Hineni? Well, Adam says Hineni in Genesis. When God says, uh, are you hiding from me, you... <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I know you ate that. <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> and he says, Hineni. And Abraham says, Hineni, when God tells him, you should uh, get your son to the mountain and uh, kill him. And Hineni is... I'm going to use Hineni here to make a rather hard philosophical point, and I hope you can go this, to this road with me. Be patient. So, I don't know the difference between a patient waiting for the doctor and be patient, wait. What's, what's the difference? What's the difference? It's the same word? Have patience. No, one with the no. patient, oh, one with the teeth. Okay, so, have patience. So, let us have a short class in existential philosophy. What is existentialism? <laughs> existentialism is the claim that people are not like Caesars. When you look at a Caesar, at Caesars, well, oh, Caesars. 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 Yes. Caesars. 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 Not Julius. Caesars. Yes. Not Julius Caesars, but Caesars. <laughs> patience, patience, Caesars, Caesars. Okay, so. When you look at scissors, you know that somebody made them for a certain purpose, to cut things. And they fulfill their, their calling, they fulfill their identity, they are being what they need to be when they cut. And when they cut good, they are good scissors. And when they don't cut good, they are bad scissors. Well, people are not scissors. Nobody made them. They have no purpose. They have, they have no calling. They have no... They are just here. This is existentialism. Existentialism is the idea that nobody made you. You have no calling. You, are just, you just exist. You have no essence. You have just existence. No, there is a Catholic kind of, exist, of existentialism, like when in the writings of uh, Kierkegaard, uh, uh, Christian uh, uh, kind of, of uh, existentialism, where Kierkegaard says, OK, there is the aesthetic man, he does only what looks right. Only what is, he says, this doesn't feel like right. So it's about feeling and more aesthetics. And there's the ethical man. The ethical man, he has a law and he does what's, what the law says. And the law says you can't step on the grass, he, he won't step on the grass. But for Kierkegaard, the ethical and aesthetical men have outsourced their existential being, because instead of taking a decision, they have outsourced the decision to the law. Oh, I'm not taking this decision, this is the law. And what if the law says that now we are killing Jews? What if you're a German person in Germany and now the law is that, then you obey the law too? I mean, what if the law is idiotic? Where is your existential stand in, against the law? So. As opposed to the aesthetical person and the ethical person, Kierkegaard is suggesting Abraham, the religious person, who answers the call, Hineni, I am here, my Lord. This is existentialism for Kierkegaard. Existentialism is replying to the call of God. And, and you feel the rubric of existential being by answering something that is higher, higher than aesthetics or ethics. It is the true calling. But I'm going to suggest, following Martin Buber, following Levinas, following my favorite Jewish philosopher, Rosenzweig, following these three, I'm going to suggest that there's a kind of existentialism 
that is even weirder and harder to comprehend, which is Jewish existentialism. Jewish existentialism is replying to the silence of God, because God doesn't speak. Our God, you know that uh, Jürgen Habermas, in one of his most uh, heartbreaking uh, uh, pieces, writes, the Jews ask, where was God in the Holocaust? And he says, Habermas, God was in Auschwitz. Where is your God? Look at your God. This is the God of calamity and disaster. Wherever he arrives, it's disaster. When he comes to storm, he burns storm. When he goes to the flood, to Noah, he brings the flood. When he comes to Job, he destroys Job. When he comes, you should have God in arm's length. You should keep him away. And you should listen to the silence. And this is mostly true after the Holocaust. You see, <coughs> Jews have a weird relationship with their God. They like him at arm's length. You know this story about the Tanur Roshel from the Talmud, there's some kind of oven, they can decide if it's kosher or not, and they're arguing, and then Rabbi Eliezer says, you know what, I'm tired of your shenanigans, I will show you that the, 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 the Tanur, the, the, the oven is kosher. If I'm right, the water will show, and all the students of the yeshiva are uh, running outside to see the waters in the Roman aqueduct and they are flowing against gravity upwards and it's a miracle and they go back to the Bet Midrash to the, to the yeshiva and they say to the rabbanim, to the rabbis, listen, there was a miracle with the waters and the rabbis are saying, we are not studying Torah from the water. So it's not a, it's not a, who cares about the water? And then he makes another miracle and the, and the trees and the, and the ceiling of the Bet Midrash is uh, levitating in space and the walls are about to fall but from respect to Rabbi Akiva they stand not falling and not standing and the trees are in the air and the water are flowing backwards and all these miracles are happening and the rabbis are saying listen we are not studying Torah from the trees and we are not studying Torah from the water this is not how Torah law works this is not a legitimate source of their authority for us so Rabbi Eliezer goes mad and he says you know what God will tell you and God comes and Yotzet Bat Kol Mishamayim and the voice of God from heaven says Torah Ker Rabbi Eliezer the, the Torah is what Rabbi Eliezer says the Talmud says Torah Ker Rabbanim even God does not make Torah in the Talmud the Rabbanim do this is because we have seen people like Jesus making miracles and changing things we don't care for miracles this is because we know God you did your deed we saw the work that you've done. This is the best you can do, this. We saw it, let us take over. Please, keep in arm's length. You are there, we are here. So, Jews have a weird relationship with our God. So, Hineni, for Sgal Cohen, for Mechatzkan Cohen, and for, I think, for Leonard Cohen as well, is not, it's not the Catholic Hineni, of replying to God, but it's he'anut. What's he'anut in English? It's replying to the silence of the absence of God. God is like this shrink that you see. You sit in therapy and you tell all your troubles, and he's just sitting there, silent. Say something, and he's silent, and his silence forces you to man up, to to fill the rubric of your existential existence, of your being. So this is Hinen. Also a little untranslatable. I have no idea how these things come uh, in the eyes of somebody who doesn't know Hebrew, but these are the forms under the letters that makes you know if it's A or E. They don't have it in other languages. So this is Kamatz, which has something to do with being stingy, with miserness. Kamtzan, right? So his head is... Uh, Yes, it's tight fisted. Kamatz. And this is Patach, which is open, which has to do with generosity. So Kamatz Patach. And what happens here is that once you hold something, you have nothing. 
Only when it's open and empty you have something. <laughs> Do you know about rice traps in India? Let me tell you about rice traps in India. In India, they have rice traps for monkeys. The way it works is that there's a box with a narrow opening and the monkey slides his hand through the narrow opening and he holds up rice. Now he cannot take his hand out. Now, all the monkey needs to do is to realize he has no rice here, leave it and go away. But the monkey cannot leave the rice because he already has it in his hands. So he stands there, sometimes for days, sometimes for weeks until the hunters comes and picks him up. Our entire life is a series of rice traps. Our job is the rice traps. We don't really have it. You can let it go. Our husbands, our wives, everything is a rice trap. You think you have it in your hand. You don't have your husband in your hand. You can let go. <laughs> You're just waiting for the hunter to pick you up, starving to death, holding the rice in your hand. So this has to do with things. But maybe one of the most... But maybe one of the most... A beautiful articulation of the concept that I'm trying to make you over and over, taking it from different angles. Maybe one of the most beautiful articulation of the subject is this one, Wings, by Michael Gan Cohen. You see, you don't need an angel to have wings. Don't need, you don't need God to have transcendence. You don't need an address on the envelope in order to have a nice letter. To God, you don't. This, this, he doesn't need to answer you. The fact that you can pray is much more important than whether he is healing you or not. The center is empty. There is no Bet Mikdash. There is no Jerusalem. There is no Jesus will sacrifice himself for us. There is no gem in the Sufganiya. It's only a pretzel. It's only the surrounding. The point I'm trying to make here, though, and I think I, I failed by, in making it, the point I'm trying to make is that while this form has existed for thousands of, thousands of years in Jewish thought, what occupies the empty center for Jewish and Israeli culture after the Holocaust is the Holocaust. <laughs> on the same place where the destruction of the first temple, destruction of the second temple, the diaspora, on the same place of the empty center, there is no Jerusalem, now sits the trauma of the Holocaust. When Adorno said, right after the Holocaust, in, in, I think in 46, when uh, Theodor Adorno said that writing poetry after Auschwitz is an act of barbarism, he meant to say that if you are a teenage girl in 1946 and you are leaning your head against the window and you are writing a poem about the blossoming of the flowers in spring while only two years ago people were standing in line to be executed as numbers you're about, you're, this is not of barbarism you are a, a holocaust denier you don't have to say there was no Holocaust in, in order to be a Holocaust denier. It's enough to write a poem about flowers. And for a dog, this was a disaster of such magnitude that it ruined poetry. Poetry has become complacent. Poetry has become a, an act of denying the past. If you are not, if, if, if you are not concentrating on if you're not staring at the sun, then whatever it is that you're seeing is just blindness, it's just effects. So this is the empty center that has gone for. <clears throat> if you have walked recently in the Sderot Rothschild mm -hmm. towards Habima, you might have seen this. You see this is the Itwanamut by uh, Kadishma? So it's the, at the end of Rothschild Street, you might have seen this. This is a statue by uh, Michal Zgan Cohen. This is an entire house buried in the ground. So it's an anti-statue. It's anti-Andalta. 
אנדרטה, what's that? אנדרטה עם מינוס. ממוריאל. It's anti-monumental, it's anti-memorial, it's a flat underground house. When you look at this house that is buried in the, in the ground, it looks like a heart. It has two rooms and two, what do you call it? Two rooms and two chambers. Two chambers. Two chambers. Like a heart, you know, the heart is... Okay? So, and, and it's, it's a house that is a heart and is buried in the ground. So obviously it's about Zionism and Islam, but it's about the Holocaust. It's about a past, it's about absence. It's about the ever present, the ever present, the always present, the only present, the, 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 the always constant presence of the absent, of the one thing that is missing. The missing people, these, these millions of people that are actually, they were supposed to be there, that, like we're living their lives and and they are walking beside us as ghosts, like these six million ghosts. Maybe, maybe this is the way to look at it. One must understand that everything I say here is my interpretation. These are not conventional interpretations. And uh, Michal Zgan Cohen, if he were alive, would come here and say he's wrong. <laughs> He was a very unique human being. He was also an artist, but he was a, a, an academic scholar, and he was a curator, and he was a writer, an art critic. He was a, and he was a prophet, and he was a hippie, and he was, he had this white beard, and he was like this uh, Walt Whitmanish person. What's the name of this beat generation poet? Ginsburg. He was like Ellen Ginsburg. Ginsburg. Yeah. He had this Ellen Ginsburg quality too. Okay. We've already seen works by Itzik Livne in this series of lectures last week. So this is another work. And it's a canvas that on top of it there's a painting of an empty canvas which is uh, the drapery. And you can think of it as, as parochet beyond which there is the Sefer Torah. You can think of it in the context of the mythological story of Zaoxis and, uh, and Apalas, the context of painters when uh, Zaoxis painted a bowl with grapes and the birds were tempted to eat the grapes. And then he said to Apalas, now show me what's underneath the cloth of your canvas. And, I would, and, and he said, no, I didn't. This is the painting. So I, this is about mimesis and illusion in art. But for me, it, this painting is about Veronica. Who's Veronica? Veronica is a, is a woman that appears in uh, the New Testament while Jesus is going to be crucified. Where are you going, man? I may have to be crucified there. See you later. And so, so Jesus is going to be crucified and he's sweating because it's Israel and it's uh, already April or May. So he's sweating. And this woman, she gives him her piece of cloth and he wipes his face with the cloth and there, there appears the image of his face on the cloth. This is the true image of Christ. This is the root of the name Veronica, Vera, truth, icon, image, the truth image, Veronica. So there is a tradition of this image in Western art, of course, this is El Greco, of the face of Christ, of the Veronica veil, the veil of Veronica. La, la, la. Yes, yes. 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 Because our God has no face. Our God is the absence of body. Absent. He has no body. And he has no body. And, and he is no body. You know when Moses asks God, who are you? God is giving him the most Hegelian answer imaginable. God says, I am whatever is going to be next. 
I am the progress. I am an arrow towards forwardness. I am the, the I am time. I am the dimension of time. I am ehaye, whatever will be. I am being, but I'm not hove. I'm not being. I will be. I am the will be. So, I I am the process of things. I am the megama, the direction towards things on a value. I am the end point, the last stop of the train. <laughs> I am ehaye asher ehaye. I am. I will be whatever I will. I will be. Not what I am now. I will be what I am. So God is Hegel. He's a very Hegelian God. And he refuses to be nailed, like in opposed to the other God that, that is being nailed. But he refuses to be nailed to the spot. He will not be, nobody will say, this is God. This, no, this. He will not be this. He is something, he is the horizon. God is the horizon. You go, he moves to, he moves as well. God is the little hand from the Laurel and Hardy uh, movies when you try to pick him up and you kick it and you it moves. And God is the ever. God is the, the God is a silence that creates you as a subject when you answer to it. Your subjectivity as a Jewish person is answering to his silence and to his non-existence. Not non-existence in like this atheist, oh, it is no good. Like, he's absent, he's, he's, he's complete transcendent, he's, he's not here. Because if it's here, it's Christianity. If he's here, it's Christianity. Okay. We are getting close to the... <laughs> I think the most recognized artist in field, when you speak about the Holocaust in Israeli art, the, the first name that comes to mind is Kufferman. Because he was himself a Holocaust survivor, of course. Because he was himself a hero of the Kibbutz Lohamea Geta Ot. And because his art is maybe the only Israeli art that is translatable. This makes sense in every place. This is not Rafi Lavi, the plywood, and you, what the hell? This is not Michael Sgan Cohen, the empty god. This, this Kuferman exhibited in the MoMA, Kuferman exhibited in, in every big museum in the world. This works. Work, I said in earlier lecture that you can have a nice uh, Rafi Lavi for $4,000. You can uh, not have this for $50,000, maybe $80,000. So Kuferman is, uh, the market value is not an issue, but it is an issue because it makes, it helps to make the point that the big, the big market, the big art market gets him. People get him. It, it works in the uh, vocabulary of abstract art, in the vocabulary of American abstract art, in the vocabulary of the uh, Kooning and, uh, uh, and uh, Pollock and Rothko and Newman, all Jews, mostly Jews. Okay, so how? Okay, so okay. What do we have here? When you when you look at a Kuferman, what do you have? What you have? What do you get with the basic Kuferman bill? Okay. Well, first you start with green. You paint the canvas green. You sometimes can see it underneath, but sometimes you can't. The green is uh, the poison background. I often made the point that Israeli art, if it had a sound, it would be the sound of a scream behind the hand, going like this. Because Israeli art is always, there's a ground. There's a green in the Kuferman, the bright colors under the Zoritsky. Uh, in the Itzik Livnay, we saw there's a bright orange underneath. In Michal Neeman, there are the drippings, and then the masking tape uh, taping over. So there's like this scream underneath, and then the job of the painter is to cover it up, to silence the scream, to plaster the, the wound, to, to mend, to what do you say, like bandage. to bandage the wound? <coughs> so the painting is bleeding, and the painter bandages it. 
So first you have the green, the poisonous green. Then you have only three colors. There's like this red, uh, uh, it's a red that is cold. You know how the kindergarten teacher used to tell us that there are warm colors and, and cold colors and red is a warm color? Well, she lied. Mm -hmm. uh, there are cold reds. This is a cold red and uh, this is, uh, uh, alizarin is a cold red. There are cold reds. So when you open your mouth and you see the tongue, it's a cold red. It's red, but it's cold. It's, uh, it's not a warm cold uh, red. Okay, so, so there's a, this alizarin cold red, and there is a black and white. These three colors create this unique purple, which is the purple of, the, of Kuferman. Usually when we're talking about Kuferman, people will say three things. First, the multiple painters multiple paintings. Every painting is a few paintings. Like there's this one, but this one is an autonomic unit. This one is an autonomic unit. Sometimes they, they have different signatures. This one is signed, and I don't know, sometimes there are four or five signatures. Because there's an, an existential stand here where I'm not the same person I was yesterday when I walked on this painting. I, I'm a new person. I, I'm standing new in front of it. But there's also uh, the idea that the act of painting is responding, is anut, to the calling of the painting. And there's an ongoing ping pong game that you mean you and the painting. You say, I want to go like this. And the painting says, look, it doesn't work. So you end this painting and you start another here. And you block and you go this, oh, this works, but this, okay, now it works. And maybe this, like, it's like a journal. It's like a, you, every day you write your experiences. And the last thing that is usually said about Kuferman, and I think it's right, rightly said, is that we use we, we like to read Kuferman's work in ethical terms. There's some kind of ethics to it. Uh, the aestheticism, only three colors. The hard working every day, going to the studio even when he was old. The jokes goes that in Kibbutz Chochmah get old. When he went to the Cheder Ochel to eat, they would have a, he would put a sign, I went to eat, I will be right back in five minutes, as if the whole world is waiting for his na one, another line of white or whatever. So, <laughs> so everybody's waiting, oh my God, he went in the middle of, like, it's just a painting, man. But he has like this ethic uh, commitment to it. So this painting, of course these paintings cannot be photographed. What you're thinking is, uh, has nothing to do with that. And, also, there have been throughout the years many attempts to interpret these pictures in terms of the imagery of the Holocaust. Now, Kuferman refused it. He refused interpretation. When they said the lines are from the inmates' uh, pajamas or they had to do with the fences of the, of the, of the camps or maybe the train ro rails, uh, he refused these interpretations because for him what was important was the labor, the, the, the painting as an accumulation of labor and responding to the painting. So every painting is an adventure and it creates itself. But on the other hand, once you see a, a one like this, this looks rather like a camp fence. You know, they have this thing and the barbed wire. I don't know. <laughs> also, one of there was recently a show in Zomer uh, Gallery in Tel Aviv of late Kuferman works. And uh, I went there uh, one day and I had like all kinds of errands to do. I had to go to the post office and I had a meeting with a friend. I had all kind of annoying errands. And I said, I'm going to spend some five minutes in front of the Kuferman and then go. And then it turns out that he was like 45 minutes there. <laughs> and when my friend called me and he said, I'm waiting, where are you? I said, listen, I get stuck with the Kuferman. I couldn't leave there. And I'm trying to make sense of why, are, why they are so moving and so effective. Why they are so unanimously loved by the market, by the Israeli critics, by critics all over the world. Some of the biggest art critics of the 20th century wrote about Kuferman. But I'm trying to, to think why they are so convincing. Oh, this is the point, I think. You can measure painting by how beautiful it is. 
and if it is uh, figurative by how well it's executed. And you can measure painting in how smart it is if it is a uh, painting about ideas. But maybe we should measure painting by a new ruler, a new measure. measure, and that is the measure of how honest they are. How, how do you believe them? Because when you look at the Kupferman, you believe every brushstroke. Now, I can have a thousand abstract painters bore me to death. I cannot stand an abstract painting when it's dishonest. When, <coughs> but when you see this guy is committed his life to this, and, every, and then you have these white blocks of the empty, like this, the, the ghost in the... the, the, the. So, he, the syntax of this painting is so <coughs> articulate that even though it's abstract, it is more meaningful than an article in art. Well, wait, explain what are you talking about? <laughs> what do you, what do you what is it? He does not say what you mean by honesty. Say what you say. Uh, by honesty, well, ask your question then. Well, well, I don't understand what the, would you show. just explain a little bit about the picture? It's interesting. Well, what you see here you see? is a painting. That is the accumulation of activities. And these activities answer to an inner logic of the painting. <coughs> the inner logic that says there's a rhythm, but if the rhythm would be constant, the painting wouldn't work. You have to block it. So there are blocks. But this is not enough. It has to be maybe elevated a little so you have the white here and you elevate it and now it's work a little better but wait a second maybe here in the left there should be no wait a second i think i should block the entire thing but not with a, like if you change something here it would it would be wrong mm -hmm. so the, the the there's a certain cohesiveness a certain coherentness a certain truth to this painting now i cannot teach this i cannot teach this like I cannot teach why a good poem is a good poem or why uh, why is a two point by Michael Jordan better two points by than a two point by Scotty Pippen? Why? They both took a round ball of leather and threw it in a but why people like this and more than this? There is something that I cannot teach. But I think that once you saw like a hundred Kuffermans, like let me tell you a story. There was a huge Kufferman exhibition in the Israel Museum, uh, I think 10 years ago, and I went with my mother. My mother has no eye for abstract art. She doesn't get abstract art. Some people don't get abstract art, it's okay. And she was really, really rather bored, because nothing happens. There are no people, no flowers, just states. And after like five minutes in the exhibition, she started saying, look, this thing is different. He changes the uh, thing and he said, yes, this picture is a little different. And I felt like through this huge exhibition, he educated her to, to see what he wanted her to see, the rhythm of the purple and white. And then at one point, there was a painting that was all white. And suddenly she cried, like, I'm a tough scientist would person, I never cried, but, but she suddenly she cried, the, like my mother who never loves, never liked abstract art, cries, and I told her, why are you crying, she said, because it's all white, <laughs> everything is gone, the, like the stripes, the, the rhythm, he, I, I mean, it's, it became a story, so I think Kufferman has this quality, he educates us to his own vocabulary, and once you buy into it, you're hooked, I think. <laughs> okay, we can start. We can start. This this was all. Uh, <laughs> we, are be we are beginning the lecture now. This is the. Lecture. <laughs> we can finally start the lecture. Okay. This was all foreplay for the uh, uh, for, uh, setting the stage for the great finale which is, I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about Gershwin. Now, okay. now Gershwin 
is uh, one of those artists that were born in the 30s. His, his family was his family was already here. His mother's and father's family were still in Europe, and there was a huge thing about trying to give them certificates to come. Some made it, some didn't. There, there are huge stories about guilt, about the failing uh, to bring some of his mother's family here. They all died in the Holocaust. And he grew up to the art of the 60s and 70s, and he was, well, one of those Israeli artists, mostly doing <coughs> Uh, conceptual art, mostly dealing with language, you know, all this uh, Israeli, all this Israeli conceptual 60s and 70s art. But slowly, something corporal has entered his work. The body started to appear in his work. Here, in a monumental, already legendary work, The Blood of My Heart, He's writing with, these are the paints that you use to paint on, on glasses, uh, it's glass paint. Mm. And they gave him uh, diseases later in life and uh, uh, Parkinson, don't use them, anyways. Mm. So he dips, his head, he, he dips his finger in the color oh. and he writes, Bedam Libi, in the blood of my heart. So it's conceptual art. It has to do with the difference between the grid, the mathematical grid, and the biomorphical forms of, of blood. And it has to do with commitment to work out. But we don't care about this so much. We care about the return of the body. This is no longer the cerebral, intelligent, absent, uh, nobody, we, our God has nobody, we are all <laughs> Amma Sefer, Hevel Ayofi V'Shekir Achen. How do you say Hevel Ayofi V'Shekir Achen in English? It's from, uh, it's, it, it's from uh, Mishlei, it's from the book of Mishlei. Hevel uh, Ayofi, the foolishness of beauty yeah. and the lying of grace. Okay, so this is from the Bible. So no more of this. Now, the body returns. The body returns. And by 1982, Gershuni is a changed man. Three things have happened. One, he went out of the closet, left his wife and became a homosexual. Left his wife with kids and decided he was a homosexual. The second thing, he was voted to represent Israel in the Venice Biennale. Wow. And the third is the Lebanon War, the 1982 war. These three things uh, drove him to madness. He was on the, oh, the brink. on the brink of committing himself into to hospitalizing himself. He was having a nervous breakdown, leaving his wife. He says in an interview that he discovered he was a homosexual. He said, I never knew any homosexuals. I was born in 1930s, I don't know, six. Nobody knew, I didn't know there was such a thing. He didn't grow in a place where it was commonplace and ubiquitous and you saw it everywhere. He grew in a, an environment that nobody's heard of homosexuals. And for him to make such a transition of life, of values, was, a, was immensely traumatic. And then the war. And then the Venice Biennale. And he was on the edge of losing it completely. And then, at that point, he turns to the Holocaust. Definitely, some, something woke in him, a great need for the work of mourning, trauer al the work of, of grief. You see, Israeli art didn't know how to deal with the Holocaust. They made pamphlets about it, they made academic in, uh, writings about it. They made business about it. They made monuments and they nationalized it as if it didn't happen to Jews but to Israelis. But they didn't know how to cry. There was no one with shoulders broad enough. You know how in ancient cultures you have mourners to come to your uh, uh, when right. somebody does you would we buy for weepers and they will tear their hairs. 
Somebody had to be this morning for the Israeli society to do the travel outback. And Gershon takes it to the Venice Biennale. He fills plates with blood and swastikas and he cries and he, and he paints on his knees and with his fingernails. And then the wall. And something weird happens to Gershon's wall when it is all one. There's no one issue of the homosexuality, one issue of the Holocaust, one issue of the war. It is all one. Because all artists are homosexuals, all artists are Jews, all artists are outcasts, all artists are in every war. There is a universal power that works here. It is stronger than any other. So you have these pictures done in the wall. These pictures are reminiscent of, you know how kids in school, they need to write to the heroes in the border, in the, in the front line. Chayal, yeah, chayal, dear soldier, we hope you, all, uh, return, you will return safe. Here are some candies from Kita Dalet Shalosh Givatai. And the soldier would get these letters and he would say, oh, it's so nice, and we'll put it in the packet and then it will explode and burn and you will find this chayal, chayal from blood. And the, so these pictures have these, like, Parent qualities. But what's weird is this, that while they are about this, they are also about these soldiers being sexy now. Oh, Chayal Yafe, nice soldier with this round lips. Mm. The soldiers as a homosexual fetish. But while the soldiers are dying and being a homosexual fetish, it is about the Holocaust. It is the yellow star of David. So everything is one. The inability to separate early and late, past and future and present, me and people from other places, it is the complete uh, meltdown of the construct of the Israeli subject thus far. It's a new, it's like this, you know how in the Marvel Universe you have Doctor Strange, he has no past and present, he looks like this, you become a person with no body, with no, your existence is like, you're a prophet. <coughs> you're a prophet. Think of a human person like a glass of water. You pull, you, 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 you pull, pour. You pour the, the water out of your own cup. Now your cup of personality is empty. There's a place to God. God can fill your cup. As long as it's filled with your shit, God is not coming. If you want to hear God, you have to empty your cup. This is like this, this the verge of madness enables this. Okay, so it gets worse. And then, and then something, <clears throat> it appears to Gershuni that he needs to Christianize his world. What do you mean by this? Well, what I mean is that he needs to allude to some uh, in order to do trower al bite, the walk of grief, he needs to bring some Christian mercy, some Christian grace. Why is this? Well, it is very complicated and we will address it shortly. But let's wait with it for just one minute. This is a walk based on four poems uh, that uh, Brahms uh, uh, wrote music to. Uh, the, the lyrics are by St. Paul. The lyrics are, uh, let me read it from St. Paul. <coughs> For now we see through a glass, darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I, we, shall I know even and also I am known. And now a bit, a bit faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. And of course, in the original, the greatest is love. You see, St. Paul, wait a second, we'll return to this. Paulus. I promise. Paulus. Yes, Paulus. 
Oh. We will return to this shortly. Okay. So what do we have here? We have the moon flipped over to become like a boat of refugees, harboring their stars as refugees, being sh uh, shielded by the cyclamate, you said? Cyclamate. Cyclamate uh, that, is, uh, that is, I think, the waves of the sea. And in the middle of this, scratched out as a negative, is the love. The Abdullah Shabbat Miyavai, the greatest one is love. And the love is the absence, it stretches it out. So you have this crisis in his painting that he needs to bring some St. Paul to it, the, uh, the Paulinic love. He needs the Paulinic love, these are the same lines. Now I'm going to try to address it seriously in all the and put all my philosophical weight on it. The idea is like this. Throughout the last 2,000 years, our culture, this doesn't mean it's true, but our culture perceived the relationship between Jews, Jewishness, the Jewish religion, and Christianity as, as the relationship between law and love. The Jewish religion is the religion of the law, and the Christian religion is the the religion of love, the Paulinic class. Maybe the most obvious, maybe the most obvious case is the Merchant of Venice. He wants his pound of flesh because he deserves it by law. Jews have to do with the law. Jews are about the this law. This is written by a Christian. Yes. You can't say this is how the Jews are. You no, no, I didn't say it's true. I said this is how things Jews. are being perceived. Perceived. Of course, this is not true. Of course. Of course. But this is such a deep cultural construct. It's deep in every Beatles song, in every John Lennon song, in every, co we will, it's all over the place, it's in our air. The idea that there is some kind of, uh, I would say, the Merchant of Venice syndrome. The Merchant of Venice syndrome is where, the Merchant of Venice is the Jew that is rational and he wants the law, but he has no, uh, what do you say here? Charity. He has no Christian charity to him. Of course, Shakespeare, by the way, is smart enough to understand that these people are bastards because they have no charity for Shylock after the case. Shakespeare puts some of the most beautiful lines in the play in Shylock's mouth and he presents them as hypocrites because a second after he gets his first drop of blood, they hang him and they are abusing him, and they show him no Christian, Paulinic love and uh, Christian charity. So Shakespeare is well aware of the falsity of this. But the idea is very strong. Listen. This is Spock from Star Trek. Leonard Nimoy. Doing the Leviites uh, blessing from uh, Jewish tradition. He represents a secular version of the same idea. The ship Enterprise is the church. This is why the captain is called Captain Kirk. Kirk is the church. And, and, and the conflict is always this, between the Jew alien, that is only rational, he has no feeling, no charity, and, the, and Captain Kirk that shows him the way. This is the... But this narrative goes in like a hundred shows. It's not only in Star Trek, and this is from the Big Bang Theory, Sheldon, he's, uh, he has no uh, feelings, he's only rational, uh, etc. But it is also the uh, psychopathic murderer, Dexter, that has no empathy but only law, etc. Et it's, it's everywhere, it's in every song, it's in every play, it's in every movie. It's everywhere in popular culture and in high culture. The Merchant of Venice portrays the dichotomy that is essential and central to Western culture. Grace, mercy, and love, and the law. <coughs> because one must realize that when St. Paul is trying to sell Christianity to the nations, he is embarking on what must be the most successful campaign of negative branding in the history, in history. He makes negative branding to the two other competitions, Logos, the Greek, and Lex, the Jews. The law, the Jews, 
is castration. Oh, he says, St. Paul, why do you need thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal? It's enough to say, love thy neighbor. This is St. Paul. Of course, of course we know it's idiotic to say it. Of course we know that uh, we steal and murder mostly from our beloved people. Of course. But this doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. What matters here is that, that the cultural, the Western culture, it's so deeply rooted, it's so everywhere. The, the dichotomy between the mother, mercy, love, father, law, Jews. And the Jews as representative of Shylock and Spock and Data and uh, Sheldon and in a thousand other shows I could spend the entire day showing you shows with this dichotomy. So the idea is basically this. Gershuni <laughs> is walking. And he tries to enlist into his army a new force, a force of forgiveness, a force of love. And he needs some Paulinic love into his work in order to pr produce, in order to produce what needs to be the most crucial mission on Israeli culture, in the mission to make some trauma or bite, some work of grief. Somebody needs to be able to cry for us what we've not been able to cry. These are works from the... Uh, this is a very simple work. He takes charcoal and he walks over the canvas and it exposes the bricks. Uh, you know, there's uh, the wood from behind the canvas, there's a structure, yeah. so it shows. But what happens is, <laughs> That surprisingly enough, you get a cross and you get a backlight shining from, you have a sense of redemption. You have like a, oh, but how can you create redemption if there's no God, God from the absence, from the, from the emptiness, from the back? From the back of the, we are talking about the, the ever presence of absence in Israeli art. El Maler Achamim, the God is full of mercy. Where is he? It is, it is the behind of the canvas. Once again, we return to the point that, uh, about the uh, art that you believe or not believe, that is either honest or not. Maybe if some other artist did this, I would, thought, I would think it's silly. Sometimes you listen to a Leonard Cohen song and you say, if somebody has. If somebody else sang it, I would say it's kitsch. The lyrics are so nice and the tune is so melodic, it's kitsch. Why when Leonard Cohen sings it, I believe him? Why is it? Because I believe him. Because there is another dimension other than either it's melodic or not melodic, the lyrics are nice or not nice. There's the, the, the personality of the performer. Okay. So the cyclamates the and we are trying we are getting into a series of works where the Rakafot, the cyclamates have become a symbol of death and rebirth, of redemption. We are talking about the redemption of the soul. Then he takes Gershuni shoe boxes and he opens them like a flower but also like a cross. And he writes parts of the prayer. He grew up in a religious uh, background, a uh, 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 religious school. And maybe there is no more Jewish artist than uh, uh, Gershuni in Israeli art. And it's amazing, because Israeli art is famous for being secular, for being not religious, for being ironic, for being distant from everything religious. This was the narrative that's been told for years now. No, we are not the Jews of the, uh, of the state. Uh, and then Gershuni brings him back the prayer. He brings back the prayer. But he brings it as it burns. In, uh, as it, and you have the association for the piles of shoes in Auschwitz also with, with the shoe boxes. And the shoe boxes become more and more uh, I think, I, there's no words for it, I don't know. 
Shan is also there, but it's also Shem, the name of God. It's Bet HaMikdash. But it's an empty shoebox. Once again, we are facing the emptiness, the absence. And the series of the six limits. You remember I showed you a page from the Talmud, and I showed you how Talmud is done as a central piece from the Mishnah, and then all the yeah. commentaries. Yeah. These pictures walk rather like this. There's a central image, and there are all kinds of writings all around. And these paintings were painted on the knees while crying, scratching. And they gave him like uh, all kind of diseases because he, he, he ate the color and he scratched it and it's got under his skin and these colors are poisonous. So fun. The forgiving God. The forgiving God. So these works are uh, the pinnacle of uh, uh, the epitome of trauma or bite in Israel. Yeah. They, are, they are the highest point. And I don't think it was possible for any other artist to make anything like it. Not in the volume, not in the, the strength, the, the power of expression, but also not in the intellectual width. Like, it has so many intellectual associations, from Brahms music, to St. Paul, to the prayers, to like a million other things that I don't know even because people wrote books about it. But, and also the idea that it all looks like a burnt paper from like a Jewish synagogue in Russia after the Cossack rampage did. It's the burning book. What? It's the burning book. It looks like burning bushes. Okay. And I want to finish with these works. Almost his last. Almost his last. Before, before, maybe a year or two before his death. And these are fascinating works. <laughs> what you're seeing here, what Gershuni did, is pretty weird. He went to the place where sculptures go to cast the uh, moldings. They bring the statues that they made from clay or wax or whatever, and then they put over it a coat of something and melt it, and then they pour the, uh, the bronze into it. And he took, and then you have to open the mold, then you take the statue. And he took the empty molds that people left, and he casted them. So, this is somebody's cast of the body. We will never have the body. The body is gone for us. There is no center. There is no gem in the Sudganiya. It's only a shell, but it's from bronze. The Jewish culture is like a galaxy. There is a black hole in the middle. But what is spinning around it is so powerful, it's cast in bronze. It's like a tornado. The eye of the storm is silent. There's nothing there but the silence of God. But the tornado is so powerful, it can rip out houses from their places. So, he cast the tavniyot of other people, always already gone statues. And he does something rather weird. He leaves the tubes that looks now like the chimneys of Auschwitz. Yehuda yeah. Michai says that after the Holocaust, God became, the people became, re resembled their God. Because he has nobody, now they are burned and they have nobody. He says the numbers on the hand of the prisoners in Auschwitz are God phone numbers. We call him, but it has no answer. The idea is that Auschwitz is such an end point for, for, for it's, it's such an extreme point. You know how things are. When people have some hard time, they get religious. Your kid is sick, you pray. 
you have a big exam tomorrow in the university. Oh God, even though I didn't study, let me pass the test. <laughs> if it's a little hard, people believe in God. If it's a little harder, they become a little religious. But when, but when it's catastrophic, they lose it. In the catastrophe, people lose it. This is why Renaissance started after the black box, after the uh, plague. plague. Because in such a magnitude of, 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 mm. of, of, uh, atroc of, of horror, people lose. So you have the empty shells. Like maybe it was a mother with a baby. I don't know what it was. The statue, the body is always already lost for us. <laughs> What we have is the shell of a stranger that was casted and then thrown away and we have statues of shells of no center. So let me just end the let me just end the talk with this. I wanted to make the philosophical point that Israeli and Jewish art and the history with the body, that the body served purposes. It was important to create an erotic body for Zionism, and then it disappeared when there was a state to replace it, and then it returned after the war and became erotic. But I want to finish with the point that the body as a metaphor in Jewish life has reached its end point when it became the absence of the body became a symbol of the absence of that, le that was left after the Holocaust. The halalim. Halal means a dead person, means empty void. Thank you very much. Ah, bravo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.